is there a need for something to be timeless? As an architect practicing from the perspective of being sensitive to nature, I would say a building should die, should, should not be timeless. For us, uh, something which is timeless, which transcends uh, any kind of fleeting trends, you know, trends might come and go. Whoever has visited IM Bangalore, I can still say that it is one of the most timeless buildings to be ever built. Nature. When you look at natural uh, elements, you you always find it beautiful. There are times when we have to keep aside our prejudices, our ego aside and see things through uh, your client's eye. My and I think the strength of contemporary practices is that the designer and the client are coming into a collaborative spirit. In a family of four also, everybody looks for my space. Money can buy various things. It cannot buy our history or heritage. Hmm. So saving it is out, reusing it is the way to go. The theme we've been given here is to sort of look beyond trends and look at timeless uh, design. And uh, this is a kind of uh, inquiry, I think, from starting from our uh, uh, academic years. It's a constant question which we have been like post on. Uh, we've been uh, discussing this, etc. So it'll be interesting to see the discussion being shared with different perspectives. Um, the first section we are going to jump right in to see what do we mean by timeless design and uh, for each of us the answer will be a little different because we work from different sort of vantage point and uh, I'd open the floor with that question to see maybe each one of you can tell us what is your perspective when you say timeless design within your practice within your understanding. And this one is open for all of you, so. <laughs> okay, I'll take that. Can you hear me all? Yeah. So, um, I, I, Divya and I run our practice and it's been uh, 14 years since we started. She's there somewhere behind, always hiding, you know. Um, we have always been very, um, I would say, consciously practicing uh, you know, uh, architecture and interior design, whatever little interior design we do. And we always feel that uh, as a first step, I think over, over the last 14 years, what we have uh, grown to uh, see and observe in our own design is to have a very clean and uncluttered spaces. I think that's the first step what we look at. Uh, because it's very important for us to have a very clear sight and clear vision of what exactly is important for us, for the owners. And owners today are uh, very well traveled. They're very smart. They are very well informed. They definitely like bespoke designs but um, the bottom line of you know is always that we need something which is simple and easy to maintain but of course it has to be bespoke so I think that kind of goes well with the way we also look at design practice and our own idea uh, so for us uh, it's very important that whatever we design, it's simple, uncluttered, clean lines, and spaces uh, probably, and I, I think the genesis for all our design is looking at spaces first, then the, you know, the, the shell. So it's, it's always the, the core which kind of excites us. And once we get the hang of, a co of our core, then we get into the shell. So I think it's very important that uh, for us, uh, if the spaces are something which the uh, the generations, you know, the age group of, uh, over, you know, let's say different generation, they are able to connect with those spaces 
they are able to cherish those spaces and the experience in, in those spaces. I think that's very important. And that's what makes for us uh, something which is timeless, which transcends uh, any kind of fleeting trends. You know, trends might come and go, but it's the memory what you make in those spaces. Uh, I think that's very important. That's what gives a lot more beyond the brick and mortar to any homeowner or any uh, client, I would say. Thank you. Yeah, I agree, Swapnil. Yeah, I, I think uh, my first uh, probably, uh, you know, uh, knock on the door for timeless uh, design was when probably I went to, uh, from college, when we went to Ahmedabad for mill owners building. And as a, as an architecture student, I think you're just studying the structure. But then I went back after five years and then I went back again after 15 years. There was always something new, something different to see. And probably I would have said, oh, I missed that. But it would have been always there. And that thing for me becomes timeless because the building starts growing as, as it starts, you know, aging. And what makes a difference is probably it's still fresh. It's something that you want to explore or probably you see differently in that building. Maybe a plant has grown, the tree has grown, the planter boxes are empty at times. So and still, it still makes a statement. It still makes a statement without being loud, without having any trend on it, without being typecast into any, any vocabulary. That was one experience. And secondly was I am Bangalore. I think whoever has visited I am Bangalore, I can still say that it is one of the most timeless buildings to be ever built. Because just that pergola which you go through, you know, you go in the month of August and you go in the month of probably uh, May, you will see stark difference in the way that space is. And I think that's what probably is, is a beauty about timeless design. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, so um, I think for all of us architects, uh, we are always trying to figure out what is that uh, design that transcends time that, that people uh, will enjoy using and of course will be aesthetically pleasing and that Going through that question, I mean, uh, one thing that we thought was that uh, nature, when you look at natural uh, elements, you you always find it beautiful. I mean, so so, and another thing that we felt is that when we go, when we travel, uh, and we see, uh, you know, these buildings that are built a hundred, two hundred years back. And you look at them, there's a common thread that goes through, which is using the materials of the land that, is, that, that it is built on. And I feel uh, that, so when I, when I look at it, there are, there are buildings built much later, but uh, that I, I mean, that, that we are not wowed by. So for me personally, I think it is about, it is about going back to nature, going back to uh, where that building is and figuring out what is the best and God definitely gave that material for that place for a reason. So using those materials, building, building something with that, I, I've always felt and uh, always found uh, that to be a, a timeless uh, a process to, to sort of get you closer to timelessness. I, I hope we get there someday. Yeah. Thank you. I think, um, yeah. I think the question is, uh, do we need to have something which is timeless? Because I think nature, if I really look at it, the only thing, the only rule in nature is that there has to be death, right? So is it, is it, is, is there a need for something to be timeless? So for us as, as architects, something which changes in time and which is eternal for a long time is, is what we find a sun. Right? The light from the sun. And is it possible for us to use light and use the characters or elements which we use in architecture, could be in the play of materials or geometry or whatever, and make that light move throughout the day to make that space timeless. At the same time that a person using that space becomes a part of that space in the journey of staying in that space. Is it possible for us to make that movement timeless? But I think as, as an architect practicing from the perspective of being sensitive to nature, I would say a building should die, should, should not be timeless. And that's, that's one thing which is very critical um, 
and make that movement more timeless rather than the physical object timeless. Mr. Ritam. So being a textile designer, we always play with uh, yarn, color, and texture. Okay. So what we think about timeless, the very first thing comes to mind is the clean, classic, elegance look. Because uh, it should complement each other. And end of the day, while using a consumer should not feel boring. Correct? And uh, whether you are at office or whether you are at home, once you come back or when you visit that place, you should always feel fresh. So timeless is something, and I truly believe uh, we have everything around nature. And we explore nature, we get everything. So be it color or be it anything, uh, Mother Earth is full of elements. So anything classic is related to nature and uh, clean, uh, sophisticacy and classic look is always timeless. That's a really um, a widespread perspective. And my take is that um, uh, I think uh, going, you know, continuing with what Pramod said, spaces that enables to make uh, tangible and intangible memories, um, I think that can be made in so many different ways and that I would qualify as timeless. And uh, also, um, before starting my practice, I worked at uh, SOM Chicago for a year and a half and when I was a fresh, enthusiastic architect, I used to volunteer to uh, give a tour of the office because our office was above the CAF Chicago Architecture Foundation. So people would come and city people would also want to take a tour. And in this, uh, we, have, we, were, we were given a set write-up and one of the things which was uh, coined as a term to explain SOM's architecture was modern classic. That is something that has stuck with me when I later came and started practicing that how, although it seemed like an oxymoron, to say that with time, architecture needs to evolve or design needs to evolve, stay modern, at the same time be classic. I think for me, that's the kind of a spin I try to put on the work we do at our practice. Yeah. So um, the next question in this segment is, I think addressing more to the young designers here or also people, cl clients who are enamored by Pinterest and Instagram and we get like loaded by, you know, the trends. So the question is to say that that's undeniable, the kind of uh, influence that, that is there. On one hand, the design IQ or design receptivity of clients and younger people is much higher because of the availability of this information overload. But as practices, um, is there something we want to advocate to say that, hey, let's bring this back to the crux and then say, if we want to make this building classic or the space classic, are there principles we can sort of give out saying this would be the way to go to approach even a design problem? Any one of you want to take it? Swapnil, go for it. I think uh, when a client comes to you for a house, probably he gets with you a, a, a baggage of memories. And we have seen this because probably someone who comes in from, he would have stayed his whole childhood in a village mm. and he would have been staying in a 5,000 square feet or a 10,000, maybe even more, I mean, acre of uh, land. And then he comes to the city and he buys a, buys a plot which is around 2,400, 4,000 square feet. But he gets with him a full baggage of his memory which is which he has seen in his village. And I think that's where, in, as an architect, you need, really need to facilitate that because what has happened is he comes with the baggage and he comes with an aspiration. So there are two conflicting things. Probably he still wants what he has seen in his rural house or where he has stayed before and he wants to aspire to have slightly better lifestyle. Now you as an architect, probably what you can do is, you know, facilitate to get a space for him to have his memory. Maybe you really need to talk to him. So I, I remember when we were doing this house, you know, he was talking about his memory of, of a house in Mysore, which was so old. And here he has asked us to build in 1,500. But over a period of time, when you started talking to him, you know, it was not the house. It was not the whole thing. It was just that one courtyard or the tree in that courtyard, which 
he kept talking and he went all his direction always went to that and i think as an young architect probably if you can filter that and try and listen and figure out what is that you know mem- memory baggage that you want to get back to mm-hmm. this house and eventually also this house will become a memory i don't know he's going to um, keep collecting memories along this house children will grow children you know kids will grow up you know you'll have parents who come in and stay with you you know uh, you know there'll be moments of happiness joy sadness travel will happen you'll you'll pick up uh, you know artifacts and get it and put it in, in that all of this cannot be planned i mean obviously as an architect i don't think any architect can plan this but there's something which allows it probably you know i call it uh, the idea of uh, absorption where you can the house should be able to absorb all this and eventually become a baggage of memory which she keeps and maybe moves ahead right the the next question i'm going to direct it to chetan sir um yeah chetan <laughs> so the question is that um, we are obviously working a lot more in urbanized um, areas and it also is a continuation of what swapnil just mentioned is that um do, do you in your practice uh think or make an attempt to say that how do we bring the essence of this ancestral home or building or the region that different people come from in a context of bangalore we also have people coming from different region in the country and settling here buying a piece of land they always bring these stories that sapnil was talking about how critical do you think is to somewhere create that connect or reinterpret it or restore it you know as a designer uh you know when a client comes with this or you know it's bringing the context back in some sense in a small parcel right. um i think um building a home is definitely one of the biggest dreams anybody has right one of the biggest goals in life uh, i would say and as an architect i think uh, our job is to enhance that dream and try and see how we can put it in the context of where we are building it of course like swapnil said uh, is it is it something where you pull out a memory from his thread and try and pull it uh, put it into the architecture or is it an image which you pull out and mm-hmm. try and uh, reinterpret it and put it in that context so suddenly you are you're also telling them that compare an apple with an apple but not with a cake or a lobster right so um, the whole idea is can we kind of see that okay you have you have lived your life in a much larger village or much larger site and then you have come into a context which is much smaller so you need to start looking at what happens in that space right right so i think but enhancing that dream is is a job of an architect yeah so it is critical that it we keep that dream alive right if i may just add to it i think uh, uh, in continuation to both what you said is communication is very important i think getting the pulse of your client is very important there are times when we have to keep aside our prejudices our ego aside and see things through uh your client's eye you know it's very important i'm not saying that you have to uh, fall for all the pin interest images and everything what they share what they bring but uh, unfortunately there are people who can express very easily there are people who fail to express in words so they take help of images mm-hmm. now we as architects and designers uh, have to filter through it and we try to tell and i think 9 out of 10 of our clients they uh, respect when we say that don't show your images right now just let's talk what exactly you have in mind and if you fail or if we fail to understand what exactly you have in mind then probably we'll go through it whatever you have to share and they they really respect that so i think it's a, a conversation is very important uh, it's important to i mean I, i not everybody comes with some sort of nostalgia of their ancestral homes or their past we have a client who we have a very funny mixed bag of clients actually so one client he says that he's he the way he when he came to describe i want the roof of my house to be something like spaceship okay i was like okay <laughs> but uh, some some i i like okay go on you know he kept on talking and then uh, 
it just seemed that he wanted it to be a fun space uh, not to uh, say that he wanted to compromise on uh, the amount of program he's putting into the house but end of the day it, he has this sort of a imagery in his head and we are hopefully trying to do justice to what he had in mind but at the same time as designers we also need to bring in um that little uh, i know sort of a character which i would say is more personal to us as a philosophy as our design process and i think how do you mix the two is is the real game actually you know yeah that's all and, and it's an iterative process where it we is, do it is a, an iterative a process lot of push and pull. yes yeah. yeah another thing is i think um, they come to you because they've they've also seen your work yeah. and they kind of relate to it and they say it's nearest to what i dream of right. so i think that helps it move it fast george you have yeah i think um, uh with respect to young young designers and how we go about doing it i think if if we are not able to use all these things that are available to us as a strength of ours or as an advantage to us i think we are ending up losers i mean the client is ending up as a loser we are ending up as a loser i so for me the way that i look at it is how can we and like uh, he just said uh, it is some people to explain in words it might not i mean they might not be able to explain it the way that they have it in mind so a uh, one way sometimes uh, i might be uh, exactly opposite of all of you sitting here but sometimes i tell them why don't you get on pinterest and send me some images <laughs> so that i get to know what you have in mind because i, I have a drive to where i just ask them to drop everything yeah. one go <laughs> yeah because uh, I, so it's I, inevitable. I feel so. I just say, dump yes, it. Yes, exactly. And they feel like they did the work. And it's at the end of the day, their space that you're designing. I mean, uh, and if you are going to be like, no, I will do it the way that I want it. Um, I don't know. Somehow, that's not what makes me uh, happy. It makes me happy that if the guy who's going to use it uh, at the end of the day, he is really excited. And of course, and like uh, Sir just said that uh, you know. they come to you because they probably have already seen your work they probably already know your philosophy so have a strong philosophy i think uh, then you'll get the client that you like that's yeah that's my and take on things and i think the strength of contemporary practices is that the designer and the client are coming into a collaborative spirit absolutely it's no more as i want you to do the service for me and i'll do it my way i think that era is over so it's a lot of dialogue a lot of iteration i think it has its own merit too yeah, yeah. i think we have to look at it as advantages uh, so you have something to add here yeah uh, so for us the consumers is like architect fraternity or interior designers correct so a lot of time for a project we get inspiration images and we look at it as an emotion and their expectation okay uh, and then we also nurture with the reality and the functional part mm -hmm. so it's a balance of everything because it has to be contemporary at the same time so that essence we are we have to be open minded and uh, there would be an ability to adapt and need to keep ourselves very flexible because the world is changing very fast so it has to be a balance of everything and classic also plays a key role here yeah. and i see that when we approach it like that there's a sense of surprise excitement and wonder left in us also because we are not so preordained saying this is i know exactly what to give you so i feel that process is really energizing in a sense so we move to the next segment we jump scales we are going to go a little bit into the city scale i'm going to keep the questions as relevant as it is for the scale we operate in so one question this is under the segment of you know presently what we are looking at bangalore and bangalore is flood ridden pramod and i have had suffered it <laughs> first hand in 2017 <laughs> um so given that the question is when we are although if you are doing like an autonomous project of a single client single villa residence um are we sort of looking at this flooding situation 
or what a crisis situation right now that's happening you know because between the el nino and la nino i think there's a change one year we have too much rain one way one year we don't so when we are doing the design approach are we looking at a macro scale are we understanding for example when a plot is presented to us is this in the drain line is this in the low lying area are we doing a larger study like that or in our practices have we evolved some kind of a strategy that we know is going to work irrespective of where the plot is presented to us keeping this in in mind so the my question in simply put is do we have macro strategies or micro strategies or are we operating with both <laughs> i think there's no one uh, one fit for all i think you really what really makes uh, working on larger scales also interesting is because you get a context to deal with you get larger sites and equally you get challenging situations or scenarios when you're working with a smaller scale you're looking at it in in a in a zone of probably uh, you know a smaller zone where you can handle it like whether it's rain water whether it's uh, you know sewage whatever so you can relatively say that you, you're trying to you know make it all self sustainable but when it comes to a larger scale i mean it's it's a challenge because you know you would have a site which is at a higher level from the road and the lowest point is is on the other side mm -hmm. and funnily you can't drain out on the lower side that's that's what the bylaws say so you really what would you do you would you take back the water back onto the road which is on the front side or find a strategy that allows you to preserve that water so those are things which make it very challenging and i think you really need to look at it at a macro scale and at the micro scale in probably much more at a micro scale with respect to a larger project because you are dealing with a community and you're not dealing with an uh, individual right. and that impact is going to be on the whole urban uh, scenario so if you allow the water to to get flooded probably somebody else will suffer your neighbor will suffer so i think that's something which you really need to uh, you know be very probably uh, have that uh, empathy and, i think and the awareness is awareness, critical yeah, yeah awareness to do that design correct is very critical i'd like you to i think uh, uh, look we work with a lot of small sites but i think um, we do of course look at whether they are on the flood lines or mm -hmm. other, and and try and see how do we address it because um, asking him not to build there is not a choice um but at certain levels if you really go back in time and say how was bangalore addressing its water management systems every house in uh, south bangalore had a well and uh, most of the water of that place was stored as perennial source of water for that house in that well and unfortunately somewhere in 91 92 when the borewell started off we started going into collecting the fossil water so i think these are small things which we start practicing in our in our own practice we would try and talk to the site client even if it's a 30 40 site that you have a small well which can collect your perennial source of water it could even recharge the ground or it could even be used on a regular basis so you try and look at it in the context of where you are and how can i make because today the the roads are not designed to permeate water into the ground right so is it possible for us to store whatever is available within our site to be used within our site there are some small elements we try and practice in our architecture yeah no we had a uh, uh, so kind of an incident in one of our project where uh, like what uh, you know sopnil talked about uh, the design strategies but of course the layout was already existing for a long time and we were just working on this plot which happened to be in the far end of the uh, this layout and beyond the layout it was a lake now we started the construction we had given like 2 feet uh, first plinth was at like 1 and 1/2 feet and then the other one was 2 uh, and 1/2 feet and it so happened that we were just about to cast the ground floor slab and in 2020 i think it rained so heavily 2020 or 21 rained so heavily that literally the entire ground floor up to the 2 and 1/2 feet it was flooded and to his bad luck all the water got accumulated in that portion of the layout because it was the lowest uh, lying part of the it they had the layout had a rajkalwe and everything was there rajkalwe was dry but the water stagnated there 
their lake overflowed and somehow the water came or got stuck here so thankfully the uh, client uh, you know we of course stopped the uh, concreting deshuttered after the water retreated we raised the plinth and the client you know uh, did a very smart thing he got into the association you know membership and he became the president and immediately he got a big uh, sort of a pit dug in the, that portion of the site in order to kind of you know allow this excess rain water get collected like the strategy what you're talking about so it was an afterthought but it worked but uh, more importantly i think uh, you know largely even if we work on smaller scale projects whatever we do in our uh, which is more contextual to us plot uh, taking measurements uh, i mean measures such as having rainwater sump or you know rainwater even harvesting or in order tank also sometimes we even encourage our clients to do that as well uh, but where we fail is i think at a policy level where as you are aware that our hsr and silk board junction gets like I flooded should have been know. built there yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I, i i think uh, you know uh, we for a longer time and if you any of you are from hsr or happen to come there you will see such odd humps over the junction you know so you can't even see the other side of the road it's like when you go climb up that uh, hump and then only you'll be able to see the, the other side so you know god forbid there's nobody uh, you know on the other side so it's so badly designed you know and uh, unfortunately we lived for a long time this season it didn't go so bad and fingers crossed so i hope it doesn't so yeah i, I think uh, at policy level we are failing unfortunately so i don't i mean we don't do too many uh, projects uh, in bangalore but uh, we do uh, large scale projects outside and there the the issues are slightly different but i uh, just just to uh, give my two bits it's uh, unless so we uh, we we have just started a project in mandu madhya pradesh which is uh, actually lacking water so so a very different uh, problem to have so what we decided is the way that it has enough rainfall is just that the rain uh, goes uh, out of the site so we basically uh, planning a tunnel uh, or a, or a trench right across the edge of the site which will collect all the rainwater uh, there and then putting it into a place and okay but those are solutions and i think as architects if we do not think up these solutions no matter which place in the world that we build um again uh, it's uh, it's just going to be a lot of losers all around the place yeah. and uh, you get the first call by the way as architects we get the first call yeah i don't so. think we enjoy a uh, good rain <laughs> we are always worried yeah so i think in our practice with guru being an urban designer who's my partner and with the strong academic connection this zooming out and seeing something even if it's a 30 40 plot to understand where its position what is the immediacy of it is a standard practice we have going further all the sort of site level strategies we all discussed here is something which we definitely bring in in the very early stage of design even before we actually start designing we study the site and then look at the strategies for it to be a manageable uh, self sustaining kind of a development um, not even design development is the word to say there as an extension of this um this is one of the nicer questions so the question is asking that leaving that kind of fad of pretty landscape i think there's a shift in the client's mindset also now that we are slowly going in treatment of land we are looking at productive landscape we are talking about water management in the landscape so there's a marked shift right in the way when we are designing also that landscape architecture is not something which is seen as you know that you manicure to make it look beautiful and uh, the question is asking whether this is a trend i believe not and uh, i think it is asking us how do we continue to sensitize our clients or the larger mass uh, to say that the landscape has to work in sync with the architecture or design and uh, it's not a separate element uh maybe you can share experiences with the new projects where you manage to achieve that maybe george you want to take that up first um 
in terms of uh, landscape design for me personally it's always been uh, like these sort of the macro level issues that i have and uh, how how do you solve it that's the first first step of this entire entire process that we take the second thing that we try to do uh, in a very strong way is to again uh, in terms of landscape design to go back to what are the native species of of plants etc that is available around which essentially means that you have to do less maintenance on it which means less watering essentially uh, and so that is the simple uh, strategy that we take uh, it is more native uh, very hardy less care and uh, functionally uh, if if uh, functionally if it's proper finally i i have always felt that nature any which way looks beautiful so yeah that's the way i take things yeah swapnal you want to take that i think uh, we work a lot in urban scenario i mean we do a lot of work for builders mm -hmm. and you know it's hard convincing them but i think if you have your clarity on what you what you want to give them and and what you want to take away from them i think they somehow come to a common point so when i say what you want to give them is probably they want any builder it looks at it from the customer perspective and he says i want a lawn for 100 people so you set that aside and say okay done but the other part of is is to convince them to do all this waste water i mean water management storm water management so we had a project where you know we were doing about 7 acres and i was telling you the same thing where the land was actually uh, the road was on a higher side and and our lowest point was to the corner and the obviously the neighbor didn't allow us not that the government allows so we really had to talk to talk out to the uh, government because we had collect the buildings were large the terrace water was lots where do we put in and they, all they say is terrace water has to be in a tank mm -hmm. below which mm -hmm. may not even get used you don't even know whether it gets used or not so we convince them to have a rainwater harvesting pond which is open mm -hmm. so we had to struggle we had to struggle first with the client to tell him convince him that this is possible then convince the uh, pollution and and the environmental board but it did happen it took time so certain things do take time in, even in terms of you are integrating landscape in terms of uh, native species so now what i see is a different trend i mean what i mean if you have to call it a trend even in in apartments people are aware that if you need less you should have plants which have less water mm -hmm. so that mm -hmm. that uh, probably the trend is coming in and i hope it's for good and it lasts because there's no manicured landscape is going to be as limited as possible and i i think that's the way to look at it even in a urban urban scenario more in an urban scenario yeah yeah the 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 next question is an extension but i'm again going to bring it to you and perhaps for myself because i also work a lot on independent residences uh in smaller tight sites where the program is actually overspilling because somehow like you said the aspiration and the nostalgia keep sort of clashing with each other and we try to fit it all how do you approach the idea of green spaces in these sort of smaller pockets we try to um, add some elements of nature inside the built form mm -hmm. could be a courtyard could be a landscape area could be used as a setback area as part of the house um, and finally it's actually left to the people in the house to maintain the garden space right but of course i think as of now we are working on trying to really look at grey water and how do you address right. from from those perspectives of water management and things like that we are looking at grey water management we are now exploring with one one of our projects on how to use the grey water inside the house itself for yeah. for various uses and how do you treat it and today technologies are there right even for a small site of 30 40 um so that's where i would say we look at landscape per se but otherwise for me landscape also includes light yes, some yes. and that's been one of my big characters throughout my projects yeah for me personally i'm learning a ton working with landscape architects like minded architects and clients so it's been a journey in the last say 5 6 years where we are being extremely conscious about how all of them fit into one big puzzle piece you know where i've realized that architecture is only one part of it i mean there's so many other things including your 
renewable energy resource plugins and water management and landscape that everything needs to come in seamlessly together and it's been fantastic so i don't think it's a trend at all um now we move back to buildings uh, it's also under the future category i before we move do you have anything to add rhythm sir because from the context of a much larger scale like you are running a factory and so, yeah, I, we spoke I, about net zero yes so emission so ruchika has mentioned a nice thing so the vision of our chairman is so when we started this hyderabad facility for flooring so he said i still remember a uh, factory in a garden or garden in a factory mm -hmm. what do you want so when you enter our facility it's literally lot of greens around and you you feel a freshness the, the moment you enter the facility you don't feel like you are getting into a manufacturing facility so that's something uh, it's in the dna of elspen mm -hmm. also the water management part the anjar facility that we have zero waste okay so every single drop of water is reused mm. okay also uh, the way the canal system is done over there because anjar is a desert area okay earlier days 10 years a decade back there used to be very less rainfall but these days the because of the climatic uh, change we get a lot of water but even then uh, the water the surrounding villages get the water through us because right. we created the storage server like and an ecosystem then, is yes, built around yes. this yeah so it's not only so it, it's it's more like a giving back to the society and uh, doing our stuff also in a in a better manner yeah that that's fantastic so we go back uh, to future but the question is addressing that while we sort of uh, raise ahead into technology sophistication uh, materials do we um, look at sort of um, adaptive reuse because when we are talking about the idea of timelessness our needs are getting different um, the scale is also becoming bigger but uh, the question wants to address do we then erase the older structures or what's the scope of adaptive reuse in our context because naturally the older buildings do not have sometimes the facilities or technology to run the current demands so the take on adaptive reuse i was thinking about facilities like louvre or uh, moma in vienna like in the european context the idea of a heritage building with a modern building is somehow from policy to design is fit in really seamlessly uh, i think we've come a little far as to somewhat preserving our heritage building but we uh, except maybe hard rock cafe we haven't really put them to like good use so what's your take have you had instances where you had to work with heritage structure but bring in a new program integrate new technology and how do we bring this kind of a mindset again saying that this is extremely valuable what we are sitting with and how do we bring it up to speed and then make it contemporary or current also so yeah uh, i renovated a uh, um um uh, a club a planters club which was about 150 years old uh, and they were of the opinion to take the entire thing down and rebuild um so yeah i think one of your questions was how do you convince them to do this uh, very again try to keep things simple i said you know money can buy various things but cannot buy 150 years of her history um so and which then uh, we went back to of course the 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 styling and all that we 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 went went back to then uh, uh went back to history and sort of got it and then went back to doing it and that's how uh, we went about doing it and i think there are a lot of takers for this and especially but i think maybe that conversation needs to get started on the fact that history money can buy various things it cannot buy our history or heritage so saving it it's out reusing it is the way to go uh, yeah that's my take on it um i think uh, i i definitely believe that adaptive reuse uh, should be encouraged um like you said that history can't be just wiped out 
you know the only thing is that the way we uh, you know i mean i don't have much knowledge of uh, you know renovation as such but whatever i've noticed i've always seen that it's more of on a very cosmetic level so it's it's like you're just repairing it you know to sustain for another maybe 10 years but it's not the way let's say europe you talked about europeans how they conserve their heritage they make uh you know modifications they they uh, kind of add uh you know uh, a lot of value to it by their intervention through their intervention unfortunately that is not encouraged here it's like don't touch it you know it's as much as that but um, a few years ago we had this uh, opportunity to design and it's a, it's in an ex it's another version of what you know this question entails uh, we we were uh, we got an opportunity to design a law college for a very prestigious institute in bangalore st joseph's and funny uh, ironically i would say uh, you know we got this plot of land which had when we were approached uh, they had a, a sort of a artificial turf and uh, as my, my memory served that you know uh, there used to be a structure so when i inquired with the priest they said yeah there was which we demolished it overnight because there was some policy which was going to come into effect that if you don't you know beyond this it, you have to retain the building you know so they immediately overnight they demolished it to get that more space and you know so um, and it so happened that i when i came to bangalore i wrote my ct exam there in that particular building it was very unfortunate but then you know destiny is such that it brought me back again there and we got this opportunity to design this uh, law college and of course uh, the program aside you know the priests who i was to deal with they seemed to be of course uh, very much you know kind of stuck on to that imagery of uh, uh, you know a christian you know uh, let's say uh, uh, missionary schools and uh, they said that you know pramod can we have you know this or arches i said father i haven't done this ever but uh, you know let me give it a thought and when we did a study of their existing uh, heritage building there's still one of them uh, which is still there and we tried to understand what exactly is that they are very fond of they are fascinated of by and you know there were elements which we picked from there you know the scale of it the materiality of uh, the old building and um, the grandeur you know so all that we thought that it will be nice to sort of bring it in this new building uh, evoke that same sense of you know uh, i would say the imagery what they have the what this institution stood for more than 100 years so how, how do we preserve that image and not just bring in something very drastic there are unfortunately there are few buildings which has been brought in there and they are absolutely out of context they, they don't fit in there but you know it was done by different different people and so as a, a step we took this very conscious decision that let's do something which is closer to the existing fabric but of course not replicating you know in the same uh, black and white manner so i think uh, it came out pretty i mean we were quite satisfied it's with it it's one that. of my favorite buildings of Thank the you. work you've done Thank you. <laughs> actually i think uh, i i would not say we are behind probably it's just a policy but if you look at fort mumbai i mean what it has done these are all buildings which were built during uh, britishers came and built it it had a different uh, use at that time but today if you go in you'll see a bespoke uh, furniture shop you'll see uh, a nice uh, fine dining restaurant and how they have probably had adapted to it without even doing this uh, you know touch up glamour on the out skin of it this brilliant goa has done it to an extent uh, the old uh, you know secretariat building getting or the gmc building getting converted calicut to an extent has done it even madhya pradesh couple of buildings have been done i think for us probably the policy lies in where what is heritage if it's a colonial building if it's a palace if it's gone beyond that 2200 years people feel the urge to preserve it but i think the heritage which we have seen after independence is something which also we need to preserve because i i remember this there was this architect called ram rahman i don't know 
how many of us know about him but he was a brilliant architect in 50s in cpwd and he's done extremely brilliant work in delhi and there was this one pavilion which he had done which got raised down without any notice for a metro station so you know we don't uh, if you ask someone there and they'll policy makers they'll say oh no ye to heritage nahi hai ye to independence ke baad bana hua hai so i hall think of, hall of nations for example hall of nation yeah. I I think it's also a cultural thing. So currently, I'm actually renovating a hundred-year-old uh, port building uh, at Nagapattinam in coast of Tamil Nadu, which is now working as a collector's residence and camp office. Uh, we've been fortunate; the collectors who've taken uh, the work there appreciate heritage, so they have been like uh, hell bent on. restoring it and uh, even when they're not aware so i i want to bring the idea of ship of thesis here like you add you repair you change you keep the original form with newer material you no more know what is the authentic original versus the current version but i think i subscribe to the idea because it increases the longevity in parts and pieces you add you change and you keep rewriting the story there without uh, losing the overall idea So I also I don't work with too many luxury clients so that I converted to my advantage I use cost as a weapon and say <laughs> if you want something which is not falling in you know within the realm of what could be con- you know looked at restoration I say it's too expensive and then they just back off <laughs> So yeah I think yeah for me I mean um, I I stay and work from a house which was built in 1931 It was built for a family of seven sisters mm. and one son, and they had their own growth there. But now it's been my space. It's it's suddenly my office space, which has changed its function. Um, a bedroom, which has become my my office space. So, yeah, there is certain level of you know respect you do to that past. By even at some places, you remove certain things from there mm-hmm. to kind of push another idea across further. Right, that's one space which I'm working on. Another space which I'm working on strongly is uh, uh, Humpy. Right? This is this is a space which is which is quite fascinating for me. Which is quite uh, I've decided to put my second part of my life there. So, so we now have a house. Uh, we are working on um, working with certain temples there and trying to see how we can build a narrative around those temples by uh, by integrating certain new languages, but how do you tell the story of the past and use the new right. new architecture as the frame to tell those stories so you kind of of course you kind of forcibly add on certain elements to kind of highlight something from the past yeah. there yeah. Yeah. You, you have anything to add there so the this question is interesting it's talking about how um, traditional indian homes i think because by the virtue of being contextual and climatically responsive and materially sensitive had uh, covered the psychological aspect as in if you walked into a traditional home there's a certain kind of slowness or calmness that sort of comes with it and uh, it seemed like the non designer had you know by practice built structures achieved it naturally and i think i'm deducing it down to this you know climate responsiveness and material doing it locally with skills that's familiar with you the question is asking how do we in modern private residences address this sort of psychological and emotional need of the client which like pramod you said sometimes they're not even articulate about it how do we ensure that the psychological and the emotional aspect of the client is catered to in the design we do because this connects back to the well-being memories they build you know and and you were talking about intangible elements like light playing a huge part in it so how do you guys approach that in your design process so i think uh, like i said uh, you know I, i let's let's look at it this way that uh, the houses which were built let's say by our ancestors they were built in a very different timeline time zone different period and i think the complexities what they were dealing 
uh, is very different from the complexities what we deal in today's time. Okay. Uh, you know, things have changed quite a bit. There used to be the houses were designed primarily as a shelter. They were very definitive programs, you know, every corner was dedicated to something and there was a shared space. But today in a family of four also, everybody looks for my space, right? Even my nine year old son, he will just shut his door and you know, can you give me some space? Like, really? A nine year old talking to me like that, some space. So, um, you know, so the, the uh, and then of course, talking to clients, their needs have changed, right? They need space where uh, they can work from home now, thanks to COVID that everybody wants to have a space uh, from, you know, to work from uh, at home. They have become more conscious about, of course, uh, good ventilation, good light, very important for them, especially post COVID. They have understood the importance of how uh, airy, well ventilated, well lit space is important for their well being. And I think that becomes uh, very crucial uh, in all the design what we are doing. Now, uh, that definitely helps in, you know, uh, helping client to achieve that uh, good health, what probably he or she is aiming for. Uh, in terms of memories, of course, you know, it, it varies. There are like we have, we have got clients who I said, you know, they want something very playful. There's nothing to do with his heritage, where he comes from. But there are clients uh, who, see, you know, one of my clients, she said like, uh, Pramod, I need something which has a bit of a traditional feel. I said, but I have not done one building which is, you know, probably vernacular. Said, no, no, not vernacular. Traditional feel, but I need something very contemporary. I was like scratching my head, you know, what does that mean now, you know? So that's when I said that I think one has to kind of get into this sort of a deeper conversation with the client. So when we did something which we felt was had uh, was modern, but a little classic also, you know, uh, which I thought will fulfill her. But she said, no, 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 no. I want fish roof like my grandmother's house where I lived uh, during my childhood days, uh, you know, and it had this sort of a karapa flooring. So now she's sort of opening up with a little more vivid, you know, memories of uh, of the past. But of course, now after one year, now the karapa affection is gone and it's come to uh, Kota, you know. So yeah, evolve evolution. We are moving to the final section uh, before we also have some indi individual questions for each of us. Um, this is into the micro aspects of timeless design, as they put it. We do have a very product specific question also, but generally before we move into that, uh, it's an extension of what we just spoke. Uh, how do we think global but do local, you know, and how does the material selection, I think George should take this question, like, right? to, to what length do you go to sort of look at the, the local material, you know, understanding the strength of it, push the envelope with it, how much does the craft part of it, which is to train the locals who may not even be aware of working with it in a certain manner, all adds up to the final sort of the product, right? So how, how do you go about it? So yeah, I think first is identifying uh, what is local and what is locally, uh, what was locally used. And also as architects, I think we are always asking ourselves this question, why? Why was it used? And most probably, especially these older older structures and when you, when you study them locally, you, you see there's a very clear why to it. So, and uh, also what I have seen is, in these older structures, there are, they have its own issues as well. Like, for example, I stay, uh, I mean, my parents stay in a, in a 150 year old bungalow. So, so it, the, 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 it has this pitched roof. I have, I have worked only with pitched roofs. <laughs> so, and uh, it has these uh, wooden false ceilings. Uh, looks very, very, like you said, has good memories. 
the only thing is at night if the civet cats are having a party we definitely know about it this guy is going good 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 the full uh, you know and uh, so so these are the issues with it so how did we solve it okay we then go to using uh, what are the mo modern solutions to these problems for example we then uh, okay we developed this concept called skin and bone architecture where the skin is this pitched roof and all of that and the bone is the concrete shell that comes over it so it's not that civet cats are not running up there is that you don't hear it and uh, also another issue with pitched roofs is the leak i mean basically there's a branch that could fall on it and there's no major issue with it the tile will crack uh, which can be replaced but the only issue is the the the, the i mean nobody is willing to get get up there and we don't want anybody to get up there during the monsoon season right so now with this uh, you know skin and bone sort of architecture or the concrete shell that comes with it uh, the we basically also slope that to and have the water outlet for it so yeah go as far as possible in the local use but also be very very clear in your mind it has its own issues right if you use uh, jason sir was talking about mud uh, and uh, i mean cow dung and straw and he also went on to say about covering it with a roof and i was thinking yeah so true because i had an, had a similar problem i didn't cover it and then yeah it yeah so so it has its problems for sure it has its problems but with today's technology with today what all we can achieve these problems are easily mitigated yeah yeah, yeah. i think i think we also as a practice experiment quite a bit with what is locally available how can we build with it but i think over a period of time we've also understood that it needs to be sustainable absolutely we shouldn't get a call for each tile breaking you know so it has to be engineered in a way that it is self sustaining it is maintainable and that's a key aspect and uh, lest it becomes a whim of you know the architect who decided to work with a certain material and did so and then did not worry about it later so i think the material sustenance or the system sustenance is something which we really take care while we are pursuing this kind of an idea we come to diametrically the opposite side of uh, you know what is local how do we sort of innovate with it versus a very well engineered uh, product um, so i'm going to read the question out so product features are essential for functionality but when integrated well they can significantly enhance the design how has effective product engineering influenced the design process and in what ways has it improved design outcomes maybe each one of us can talk about a product we discovered and the sheer brilliance of its engineering has enhanced the you know the the space for us the design for us i think for me it's uh, i think today one of the biggest available material with which we can construct is waste mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and is it possible for us to really relook at how we can work with waste and make it into a building construction material mm -hmm. and i think that's one of the journeys we're going into another journey we're going into because of my uh, leaning towards biomimicry is is to really look at uh, is it possible for us to look at materials which has a cyclical process which means that at the end of its life can it become food for another process and is it possible for us to relook at some of the new materials which might, which might come out right so yeah i think uh, waste and uh, materials which can become cyclical in nature is something mm -hmm. we we are really looking at in the near future so you close the loop you're not looking at a cradle to death pattern but a cradle, cradle to cradle, cradle, cradle pattern. pattern yeah, yeah. It's like a very infinite loop right right for me specifically in the recent past i've been working a lot with earth we make our bricks we do rammed earth and i in the last year i have discovered these earth blocks i think uh, it suddenly has is making the earth construction accessible to sites which does not have the suitable earth or does not have the size where we can dig up and make the own our own blocks Uh, i think and it's engineered really really well very innovative in a way it can interlock uh, you know it can remain as an exposed wall so for me that's a sheer brilliance i've discovered in the last year and i'm really looking forward to multiplying the number of projects because whatever said and done when we build with earth in the, the process is slow and 
each site if it's going to take three years and it's not going to be remote enough you know the client is not going to be patient enough this suddenly is accelerating the idea that you can afford an earth building and you can buy it off you know literally so i feel that is an advantage of the production line and the engineering um, you you want to share One something thing is similarly yeah, yeah. is like we're working with some gram panchayat offices mm -hmm. and the whole intent is to bring mud back as a very new material to the to the village right so we are we are even looking at the various uh, policies of the government of employing local people and trying to train them with mud as a very new material not mm -hmm. as a old material right right so that uh, it becomes a new language for them and they can start building with mud in in those villages so that's that's something which on similar lines we work yeah. on ritam sir you have anything so, to so, add uh, quick thing uh, so the product the click and lock uh, product the spc that we make so we can crush that product to powder mm -hmm. to create a core again okay okay so that is very simple thing but we are ready to regenerate a product out of it because when we started the facility we that was back of the mind like how we can reuse it so we can get it back we can crush it that becomes the core of my product again and we can remake a product yeah. and and also i think uh, repurpose is something very unique uh, we also create coasters out of our waste so that becomes something very unique so repurpose is something that for every industry i think uh, that's important hmm. uh, apurva mentioned this while in her presentation you know about collaborating with specific needs she was talking about a certain requirement um, so the next the final question for us to discuss is that um in what ways can product engineering help a designer in shaping and refining design to create innovative and cohesive products i think it's talking about how the industry can meet the designer and therefore collaborate and create a product because often there might be a gap between what is perceived as the market requirement versus the way we especially the best bespoke work where we try to kind of innovate everything and work with everything specifically there's a huge gap so what do you think are the collaborative possibilities um, out there i i you know in last few years we have uh, been trying to work with uh, certain materials which used to be used quite frequently earlier but unfortunately we used terrazzo you know in two of our projects with local artisans there are now lot of players in the market who come with micro uh, you know concrete and so many other options are there terrazzo with some sort of a coating sealer but here was this guy who had worked uh, you know in 2016 and i said why not try him again but unfortunately we failed miserably i mean laying was good polishing was horrible and it gets stained and i we are like now thinking you know was it a good idea uh, and we have no answer how to fix it because we spoke to many people everybody is giving their of course you know opinion about uh, use this chemical and it'll it'll definitely arrest it use this product it'll definitely remove the stain blah 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 but unfortunately i didn't get that confidence so far you know and so i wonder if there 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 should be and you know and i wish there will be very soon a place an institute where such experiments can be done to revive uh, some of these practices which i would say is still very sustainable you know uh, using waste using you know uh, products which otherwise doesn't get you i mean our building industry generates a lot of waste now is it possible to reuse them repurpose them and give it the same value as a high end product you know gets it because there is always a taboo attached to it also that why am i going to use filth in my house you know or scrap you know or, or blocks made of uh, scrap in my house it def definitely needs proper education 
and information sensitization. Well. And I think if there is a center where even as customers, uh, owners, you know, they come and experience that this is how things are done and this is, there has to be a certain level of confidence that needs to generate. And as architects and designers also, we need to feel empowered in that sense that, hey, there is this material which we can use it. This is a very small example I'm giving. There's of course, with new technologies, innovations are happening and, you know, one of those rare high-end projects where we are working and we are discovering ourselves that, oh, wow, there's something like this also, you know. So money can buy you a lot of new things, of course. We are now, you know, exploring the other side of the spectrum. <laughs> yeah. So I also want to answer this one because uh, my partner and husband being the urban designer, the scale at which he thinks is diametrically opposite of how I operate. Therefore, we survive with each other very well. Uh, so he, uh, he goes to places. So he went to Pune to an industrialist place where they called him to design master, do a master plan. But he found this quandary dust, the steel dust. And he told them how that can be used into like a sandbag. It's essentially the same, right? And the strength is really high. And he built a cottage for them with those sandbags or the steel dust bag. And we've also been approached by um, a third generation inheritor of a quarry, um, not this one, uh, the quartz stone factory in Rajasthan. And she's seen our work and she contacted saying, can we make bricks with this? So we've got a sample of that. We are trying and experimenting and saying, how do we sort of engineer this? But this is also specific because Guru is thinking like that. In, from the product level and he wants to go into the science of it, study the compression, etc. It may not be the case with all of us who are more into designing the spaces at the core essence. But I do think that between the intent to reuse waste, between the industry wanting to create zero waste in whatever product they are making, reminds me of this fabric brick that has been coming uh, you know, around where you can compress fabric and create these bricks to build. I think there has to be an R&D cell of sorts, which the industries open up and wherever and whenever we find the right opportunity, like a couple of examples I was talking about, we can come and plug in and then say, hey, can this idea be engineered and mass produced? And I strongly believe as much as I believe in sustainability, whenever we talk about new product, it has to be uh, affordable and accessible for the mass. And till then, it is still an elite idea. However environmentally sound it is, I think my personal wish is that we remove that elite idea and then some of these ideas we spoke about, whether it's timelessness or integrating sustainability or land management, landscape, has to become the default of the way we think about design. With that, I'd conclude and I think there is a section where uh, someone else is going to ask each of us a specific question and we are done for the day and food is waiting, I hope. <laughs>